2 Timothy chapter 3, as we are now moving to a, a uh, new chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of the pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Woohoo! <laughs> what a glorious day, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I read, read down through that. We're only going to get through verse 1 this morning, but I read that because there are some things here that as we move now um, into the passages, there are two things here. Verse 1, this know also. There's, there's some things that we are to know about the characteristics of the last days of the dispensation of grace. Okay? Verse 5, the secondary thing is the end of verse 5, from such turn away. So we have to know some things about the description here. We have a responsibility to know about the last days, have an understanding about the last days. As we look around and we see things, we can understand it. In order, then we have a responsibility to have nothing to do with those things and to have them not be in our lives and to not be a part of our lives. Verse 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1, this know also. What we're going to be studying and looking at in chapter 3 is really the result of the satanic policy coming to fruition with the body of Christ. The captivity of the body of Christ the end there in chapter 2, verse 26. This know also, connected back into chapter 2. Well, how did we end chapter 2? That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. There is a result, an impact on the world when the body of Christ is taken captive. In other words, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. If you look at verse 2, 3-2, you see the four men? That is mankind. The women are not excused from this. That is more than just the believers that he's going to describe here. This is the world. This is everyone. You'll notice in, the, in verse 2, you, you look down, you see that unthankful? What was the problem in Romans 1? Do you remember Romans 1? Go back to Romans 1. Romans 1. Romans 1, verse 21, where Paul, describing the heathen, says, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were, what? So if they're unthankful, who are we talking about? The heathen, okay? But also, when you go back to 2 Timothy 3, you're also in verse 5 talking about some folks who are saved, that have a form of godliness, but no power. So we're going to begin to talk about both groups, saved and unsaved, but really that isn't the issue. The issue is, is here's what the world is going to look like in the last days of the dispensation of grace when the body of Christ has been taken captive by the satanic policy of evil. Okay, follow that. So as we get into this, because usually we, I hear people, oh, he's, he, in verse 2, 3, and 4, oh, that's just the unsaved world, or oh, that's just the believers. Not necessarily, it's everybody. This is the condition of the world as a whole, okay? Because when we get down in verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, now we're back over talking about believers who have left Paul, who have left off into the apostasy. So the captivity of the body of Christ is the great demonstration of the depravity of humanity. The things that we read in verse 2, 3, 4, 
there in 5. The basic sin of our old sin nature. The list there in 2, 3, and 4 and 5. It isn't going to get any better. It's just going to get worse and worse. It's going to increase and increase. And as time goes by, and in the last days of the dispensation of grace, before the rapture happens, they will have, those sins will have matured into this outstanding characteristic of the general populace as a whole. Okay? Again, the four men in verse 2 has to do with all mankind. And what Paul is describing is the impact of the body going off into apostasy on the world around us and about us. If you come back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I, I'm slowed down making some very blunt statements because our responsibility as Bible believers, as grace believers, as people who understand the truth rightly divided, our job is to, do, is to, main, is to be able to understand and recognize it. Okay? And then do what verse 5 tells us, stay away from it. Okay? 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, What is the local assembly to do? But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the what? The truth. What are we holding up? The truth. If we're taking our stand, the pillar, the ground, make, the ground makes that pillar stable, doesn't give away. You know, there's no sinkhole involved. It's solid. It's there. At home, my driveway is sinking right now. So it's beginning to come across, you know, where it meets the garage. It's coming apart. And I'm like, well, what's going on? Well, then the other day, I'm trying to roll a tire, my trailer across, and and it goes, ba-boom. Well, guess what? The driveway is sinking. This isn't sinking. What are we holding up? The truth. When the... Local assembly is doing its job. There is an impact in the world, in the community around us. Okay? When we're seeing people get saved, see people come to the knowledge of the truth, that does what? It cleans people up, doesn't it? So then it cleans lives up. But when it doesn't do its job, that's what we're getting at in 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 4. Look at verse 1. When the local assembly is not doing its job, what's going to happen in 4.1? Some are going to what? Depart from the faith, the middle of the verse. You see it there. Chapter 5 and verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath what? Denied the faith. Depart the faith, denied the faith. Verse 12. Having damnation because they have what? Cast off their first faith. What's going on here? Chapter 6, verse 21 which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Paul has already warned us. He's already warned the local assemblies what's going to happen. People are going to depart, deny, cast off. They're going to leave it. Our job in the local assembly is to stay the court, be that pillar and the ground of the truth. So when you come into chapter 3, is everything okay? okay. I just hear noises. (laughs) Huh? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I, I thought it was I thought it was Bob's stomach there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Second Timothy three, and verse number one. So the the issue here, what Paul's going to describe now as we begin chapter three, is the impact on the world about us when the local assemblies, when the church, the body of Christ, doesn't do its job. And I'll be honest with you, you see it around today, don't you? I read this list of chapter 2, I'm I'm sorry, verses 2 through 5, and it's everywhere. And it hasn't gotten any better. It's just gotten worse and worse. You, You look around at, we're in an election cycle. 
you bring up election, you bring up anybody, and you, you better duck. You can't have a civil discourse anymore. Why? Because it's it, ultimately the church, the body of Christ, has failed to do its job in the community where we are. You bring up Trump, and you better duck. You bring up Pelosi, you better duck. Why? Because you got two extremes. There's no more meeting in the middle. We stay at our extremes and we come out at the sound of the bell. The problem is, is if you go back in this country, just 30 years, 40 years, that was not the case. When Ronald Reagan made his, one, of his, one of my favorite speeches, where he talks about the Bible, and, and he talks about a King James Bible being where, they, where we need to be, Everybody in the room understood what he was talking about. If you say that same speech today, nobody in the room knows about it. Nor do they understand what it... They'll know what a Bible is, but they will never know what the King James Bible Why? Our society has gone, done what? Moved away from it. They don't care. Exactly. They've moved away. But who? why did they move away? Well, they moved away because the church, the body of Christ, quit doing its job. What did they do? They left Paul. They've left right division. They've left the Word of God. See, stuff we've been talking about in 2 Timothy 2. They're moving away from that pillar in the ground of truth. So then, then when you go into society, there's that fly. Somebody warned me about the fly yesterday. When you go out into society, I, have, you ever, have you talked to young people? You ought to talk to young people. They don't know who Jesus Christ is, except for a curse word. Talk to them. I do. I work with them. My monitor this past week, she's 25 years old. So I'm just talking, what are you doing this weekend? I'm going to church. Church? Really? Where do you go? I tell them. Oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, we study the Bible. That's what we do. Oh, really? Really? I go, well, do you go to church? Yeah, I go every now and then when I feel like it. Well, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Yeah, he's a great guy. Really? Well, did, what about Calvary? Yeah, that's a story. We don't know. We don't know for sure. God, so I quoted her a few verses, and she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll watch the kids. You keep driving. I'm like, okay. Because you got to be careful. You don't want to offend anybody. You know. The point is, is you, when you look around us, the election. What about marriage? Marriage. The definition of marriage was never an issue until about what, ten years ago, when all of a sudden it became an issue. But it, you know why it became an issue? Because the church quit doing its job. How about the gender issues? homosexuality and all that. It just got worse. Why? Because who quit doing its job? The church did. Now, I say that, and I say it like that, because every now and then there is a spark that interjects into culture. Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation, 500 years ago, he came to understand justification by faith alone. He, had, he was a politician too, by the way. He was a Catholic priest, but he was a politician. He had to wait for the politics of the right moment to nail the 95 Theses on the door. But as soon as he did, what happened? Chaos. Rumbling started. That was the spark that sparked the Protestant Reformation. But you know what Luther did that was way better than the 95 Theses? Was he took the Texas Receptus and translated it into German. And he put the Word of God into German into the hands of the people so they could read it and understand it. His German Bible was then subsequently translated into almost over 30 different dialects. What did he do? He took a stand for justified by faith only. Now, he didn't take a stand against everything the church was preaching, but he did that. But he translated the Word of God into people's languages so that they could then read it and understand it for themselves. That then boiled over into Europe, 
uh, that was in Europe, into England. Where in England at the time, they're working on getting the Bible in their language. Took them a hundred years to get to the King James Bible of the saints doing what they're supposed to do. You look around today, what are we doing today to the book? A little highlighter, a little white out here, a little change here. We'll put it on the overhead. You don't even need to tote a book anymore or, you know, okay, or the tap, your, your electronic device. And you, we'll just post it for it. The church is doing what? Giving up. Fly up the white flag. You come to here to this place, we study, you got books, we open, we get into it. I want you to know some things, look at it. People think we're weird. I had another lady at, at the bus yard. I talked to them all. She's Catholic and so forth. And she's like, well, yeah, I go to Mass on Saturdays. I go, well, I go to church on Sundays. What do you do on Mass on Saturday, you know? Oh, we do this. I go, yeah. She goes, well, what do you do? I go, we study our Bible. She goes, you study your Bible? I go, yeah. She goes, Wow. I said, here, go to buttnow.org, check us out. Now she'll find, you know, she'll see me up there and then she'll go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you know. The problem is, is what has happened to the church as a large? It's sold out for the politically correct, it's sold out for different things. Follow that. What's the result? What's the impact? 2 Timothy 3, what's the impact? It's just going to get worse and worse. The depravity of humanity just continues to get worse and increase. Also, verse 1, this know also. Here's what's going to happen when the church is in apostasy. And I'll tell you what, it's been in apostasy since Paul's day. Okay, Paul wrote 2 Timothy. He's writing about it. What Paul's telling Timothy is there are some things that you need to know. And we have a responsibility to know the characteristics of the last days of the dispensation of grace. Then the question is, is well, why do we need to know that? We'll go back to 224, chapter 2, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not what? Strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patience, instructing those that oppose themselves. The reason we're to understand what's going on in the world around us is so we can go be the servant of the Lord and do the ministry. So that we can go and do the ministry effectively. And in order to do it effectively, we have to know what the world around us looks like. And when you look around and you go, oh, brother, and you throw your hands up in the air, you shouldn't throw your hands up in the air and say, why are people this way? Because Paul is going to tell us. The church isn't doing their job. What is, the, what is our job as ambassadors? Real simple. He would have all men be saved. So we're to proclaim the gospel clearly, simply. And then to what? Come to the knowledge of the truth. Proclaim the issues of right division, the issues of grace, simply and clearly. That's why it's simple. Who makes it complicated? We do. Religion does. So when you get going here, and until the end of the dispensation of grace with the rapture, it's just this is what it's going to look like. That's what Paul's telling Timothy. Here's what it's going to look like. Men are going to do what? They're going to be lovers of their own selves or covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without, I mean, it's just going to go right in the, right in the toilet. That's what it's going to look like. By the way, if you... Look down in chapter 3, if you look down at verse 14, at the end of all of this, well, in verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That's the end of the list, the picture. But what does verse 14 start with? A but. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then he goes into about the Word of God, because what's the Word of God going to do to you? Support you? Establish you? Stabilize you? Be that sword that you can go use as you're dealing with men of reprobate minds. You follow all that. All right, that's an introduction. Go back to chapter 3, go back to verse 1. 
okay? So as we get into this, and we get into this section, it's connected. This, no, also. In connection to what we just went through in chapter 2, where the local, where the church, the body of Christ at large, is, it has left Paul, chapter 1. Now they're leaving right division by leaving the pre-trib rapture viewpoint we looked at last time. Now the result of the church being in the captivity, this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And this verse gets to get kicked around a lot because of the last that term, the last days. Perilous, dangerous times. Danger. But the last days. So then the question is, is okay, the last days of what? Well, come over to Acts chapter 2. Because the la- there, there are last days all through Scripture. Look over at Acts chapter 2. Obviously, the Paul is talking about the last days of the dispensation of grace, right? We can move on, but this is Bible study, so you need to pay attention to some of this in a little detail. Acts 2, look at verse 14, because notice the last days of prophecy. Acts 2, 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them. So Peter's talking here. Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Remember last week we were talking about the literal method of understanding on those foundations of the rapture? The literal method. Literally, who is he talking to literally? Israel. The people where? In Judea, in Jerusalem. This is not your hometown, and this is not your state. I listened to Haggy a couple years ago on TV, and he's like, Jerusalem is your hometown. Judea is your state. Not in, when I go look on the map, we're in the state of confusion. I mean, Arizona, okay? <laughs> All right. No, this is what? Literally, he, who's he talking to? Israel. So we're going to talk about the last days of prophecy, and guess what they're going to be? A little different than the last days of the dispensation of grace. Verse 15, For they, these are not drunken, talking about those filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet who? Joel. Now, if Joel was here, he'd go, hmm, okay, because <laughs> he, he, he does that. So he's going to quote Joel 2 now. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit, and the day of Pentecost is fully in and the Holy Spirit comes, what is that? That's, that is phase one of the last days of prophecy. How do you know that? Verse 19 starts with a word, what word? And. Here's the other, here's the other shoe. There's two shoes going to drop here. One, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. The and there, that's the judgment, the second coming. And the issue of the last days of prophecy has to do with that great and notable day of the Lord. That's His second coming when He comes back. Now, if you drop down to verse 30, he comes back to do what? Well, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, and of the fruit of his loins, according to flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. The his there is David. What's he coming back to do? To sit on David's throne, isn't doesn't he? So Jesus Christ coming back to sit on David's throne, to rule and reign in Israel's kingdom here on the earth. So in the last days of prophecy, there are two things going on. Two signs are clearly given. You clearly see this. One, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And two, His wrath is poured out. That's what verse 19 and 20 is describing. When you see those specific signs, Israel, guess when you know you're at? The last days. The end is coming near. 
Now come over to Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21, and start in verse 25. I know what happens. You get out there around people today, and they look up, and that, that, did you guys see that harvest moon a couple months ago, and it was all real bright, real beautiful colors? Now, see, blood moon. I think they called it a blood moon. Oh, see, there's the moon turning blood. I'm like, that ain't no blood. Well, last time I cut my finger, blood was a little darker than that, you know? But what are they reading? They're reading these passages, and they're going, hey, there it is. By the way, who's, who was speaking in Acts 2? Peter was, and to who was he talking to? Israel. He's not, that wasn't Paul, and that wasn't you, see. Look at Luke 21. Luke 21. The Lord is speaking. Verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, the stresses of, the, of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You know what? When that stuff happens, you can't miss it. Men are going to look up and they're going to run for the cliffs and hide in the rocks. That's that song we sing, The Cleft of the Rock. And then about you and I today in the Bible, it's about Israel and her program. I mean, it's a beautiful song, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the song, but there, well, look at verse 27. And then, big word, underline it, capital, square it off, however you do. Then shall the, they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. And lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Isn't that interesting? They got all these signs. You can't miss them. He says, that when you see all of that happening, then the Son of Man's coming back. And when you see all that, then look up. They're not looking up here. It actually, oh, come over to Acts 1. Look at that. Notice that. That's very interesting. Uh, Acts chapter 1, Peter and the boys and the little flock were never looking up. The only time they looked up was when they saw these signs happening. Then they knew to do what? Look up, because here he comes. How do you know that? Acts 1 verse 9. I tell you, folks, I try to remind you, every word on the page means something, and it matters. Got to pay attention to every word. Then look up. When you see all this stuff, then look up. Why? Because he's coming back. Look at Acts 1.9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? What are you doing sitting here looking up for? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Then return they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from, and so forth. They're at Mount Olives. He leaves. They're watching him go. The angels show up and says, what you doing looking up? Don't you remember Luke 21 when he said you're not supposed to be looking up until he comes back? You got business to go do, go do it. When he comes back in his route back in his second coming, the Lord does not put a foot on the planet, on the ground, until he gets to Mount Olives. He puts his foot on Mount Olives and it splits everything. And the Mediterranean then feeds the desert because it's done. He's won the battles. He's about to, he's going to, well, he hadn't won all the battles because he's got to free Jerusalem and the Battle of Armageddon, the final one, and stuff. He, he's on that charger coming down through there, and he's covered in his vestures dipped in blood. He got the, four, he got the speckled horses behind him. Well, why would that? Have you ever rode behind a horse when mud's around? What happens to the guy behind you? He gets a little muddy, doesn't he? Okay, you know, I watched the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby and all those guys, and they ran that last one in rain or something or one of them. And, and the poor jockeys are going, and, 
and they, he wins. The horse won the triple crown, and they go up to interview him, and he's like, hang on a minute. <laughs> now I can see you. You know, <laughs> He's been ripping the tears off as he's going. And so, Why? What happens? You kick mud up, what's going to happen? Well, when you kick blood up, what's going to happen? You read that description in Ezekiel, and those horses are, he's bloodied. Then they get speckled, and they go all the way back to pure white again. Why? Because he's out leading the, I'm coming back, the wrath, the judgment. They're not to be looking up until what happens. The sun, all that stuff begins to happen. Then they look. You know what Paul tells you and I in Titus 2? Looking for that blessed hope. Where are we? We are to be looking up, aren't we? Two different programs. Come over, you're in Acts. Come over to chapter 3. Chapter 3. Chapter 3, <clears throat> Paul over there, he, he, later in Timothy, he's going to say, all, that, all those who love his appearing. Paul tells you and I, man, we're to be looking for him coming back. Peter says, don't you be looking up. You don't look up until it's time for his return. Then we look up and we see it. Acts chapter 3, look at verse 18. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins, again, may be, okay, something future coming, may be blotted out. When? See the, uh, the future tense of this. The times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. By the way, this is all national, the ye. Helps you understand the, na- the national issue. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. That's what Peter's talking about. The Spirit's been poured out. When he comes back, the time of restitution, man, it's going to be wrath time. Verse 22, for, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Well, what are the these days? These are the last days of prophecy. But notice what Peter's doing here. Peter is laying out something for them. Verse 25, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenants which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Peter is raising an issue here. In the last days, the Spirit gets poured out, the wrath is coming. He is offering Israel the opportunity to receive the restitution of all things. He's offering them literally to have the kingdom fulfilled in them. Before the kingdom can come, the Holy Spirit's poured out. By the way, it has been in Acts 3. The wrath is to be poured out. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the wrath to come. They've been equipped. The little flock you study with us in John 17, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, that upper room, he's equipping the leadership to go through the 70th week of Daniel. They're ready to go. They're waiting for it because there's going to be a fulfillment. Notice in verse 25, our father's saying unto who? Abraham. Peter's looking at that believing remnant at that moment in Acts 3 because he doesn't know anything about the interruption. Paul. And he says, you guys have an opportunity, the nation out there, you have an opportunity to be God's people as he's going to bring in the kingdom and the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. You have an opportunity to get in. And you know what the nation said? No, thank you. 
We won't have you. Rather, in Acts 7, what do they do? They stone Stephen, the last, the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. Come over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Well, you know what? You're in, are you still in Acts? Look at Acts 7. Sorry. Acts 7. They stone Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit. They do the one thing that they, Matthew chapter 12 says you can't do that was unpardonable, and that's that they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You can talk bad about the Lord and the Father all day long. The Father had already forgiven them on Calvary. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But you mess with the Holy Spirit, that can't be forgiven you. Okay? That's why... When Stephen looks into heaven, he sees the Lord doing what? Standing, not sitting anymore. Even though Stephen says, verse 60, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Too late, it's been laid to their charge. The wrath is coming. But what did God do in chapter 9? He talks to Saul of Tarsus, the man leading the rebellion of the world against God's people. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Lord, who art thou? And you know he's, I, my favorite thing, you know he's saying, don't say Jesus. Please don't say Jesus Christ. And he says, I am Jesus. First time he finished that sentence is then with the revelation given to the Apostle Paul as he completes the picture of Jehovah. Now come over to 1 Timothy 1. God interrupted that program. What should have fallen? Wrath. We're in the last days. The Holy Spirit's there. Wrath should have come. But rather, what did God do? He introduced the dispensation of grace. He introduced the program. Now, in our program, guess what kind of signs we have? None. <laughs> There's no signs. There's no way to indicate and understand when the end of the dispensation... By the way, what ends the dispensation of the grace is the gathering together, the rapture. There's no way to know that. So when you hear somebody say, hey, 1984, that was a few years ago. Didn't happen. Well, no, I really meant 88. That didn't happen. Well, it's really 96. Or no, 2000. Oh, geez. Why 2K? That didn't happen. How do you know it didn't happen? We're still sitting here. Okay, so now it's going to be 08. That didn't happen. Well, it's got to be 10. That didn't happen. Now it's 2020. You know what, Paul, how Paul talks, Paul doesn't, Paul does, it could be when? Anytime. We call it the, um, I can't say the word now eminence of it. 1 Timothy 1, look at verse 15. 1 Timothy 1, 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy. Why did he obtain mercy? Well, verse 13. Who was before a what? What was he doing back there in Acts 7? He was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Now, you got to pay attention to the timing here. Acts 7, he's violating Matthew 12. Okay, verse 31. Acts 8, he stoned Stephen. Saul of Tarsus is guilty. He cannot be forgiven under Israel's program. Acts 8, Philip is out, demonstrating that the Samaritans are ready, demonstrating with the, through the Ethiopian that the Gentiles are ready. Who's not ready? Israel. First part of Acts 9, what's Saul of Tarsus up doing? Getting the letters, the authority to go. On the road to Damascus, the Lord stops his career, wild career. In Acts 7, when we talk about the fall of Israel... It's not in 9, it has to be in 7 in order for 9 events to happen. If it's not in 7 and it's in 9, then the Lord could not stop Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and converting. Because st if it's in 9, you're still where? 
in Israel's program. In seven, you're guilty, you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. That's their fall. Eight demonstrates that. Samaria is ready. The Gentiles are ready. Israel isn't. They have what? Fallen. Follow that. It's critical to catch that timing. Then in nine, he says, that's okay. I got a, a, our amendment A. <laughs> I'm going to go do something else now. And I'm going to interrupt the wrath. And I'm going to do it with the guy you guys are all worried about. I love that thing in Acts 9. He says, and the church had rest. <laughs> he was wreaking havoc on them. Ananias says, "What, Lord, are you sure you want me to go down there and talk to the guy? He's hunting my head. And Lord, guy, the Lord says, yes, he's my servant. And he's going to be my representative before kings and Gentiles, the world, and then Israel. Israel's last in that list. Why? Because what had Israel done? They had fallen. Verse 13, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see the in ignorant and unbelief? Real quickly, that is a description of all of mankind, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And you know what Paul says, verse 15, I mean verse 16, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a what? A pattern. When you look at me, you know what you see in me? The ignorance and the unbelief. I represent mankind, humanity as a whole. He was a Jew and a Gentile, wasn't he? And you know what I obtained? I obtained mercy. But notice he said he, that, might, that Jesus Christ might show that in me first. Jesus Christ, might, Jesus Christ might show forth all what? Long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. With Paul, there is now going to be the pattern for the dispensation of grace. And that pattern is a pattern of long-suffering. What did the world deserve? Wrath. Rather, he poured out what? Long-suffering. See that? The last days of prophecy are on the page. But rather than hit them with uh, Joel 3, the, the wrath, he interrupted that, and he says, now it's long-suffering. And because of the long-suffering, come over to 2 Peter 3. Because of the long-suffering of Christ, because of the long-suffering of the Godhead, let's say it like that, okay? There's, <laughs> men are just going to get what? Worse and worse. Not going to get any better. Oh, for the good old days. Baloney. The good old days didn't have air conditioning. Hey, I lived here with no AC in a truck. I moved out here in August... 25 years ago, whatever date that is, 1990-something, and I had a Mazda B2000, no AC, had a camper shell, no back window, so when the shell filled up with heat, guess what I filled up with? Heat. I threw all my worldly possessions and a dog, a miniature schnauzer in there, and moved out here to be with my future wife, who had already said I do, so I will. And I get out here, and the first thing I did was put that truck up for sale, didn't I? And I went finding something with AC, because August here, you know what it's like. <laughs> hey, it didn't get worse. It, oh, for the good old days, baloney. They were simpler, yeah, if that's what you mean. Look at 2 Peter 3. Look at verse 3. Knowing this first, here is Peter writing to the little flock, Paul is on the scene. The dispensation of grace is going. And Peter is, gonna, is writing. He's going to die. He's leaving the scene. His, his departure is coming. He knows it. He's finishing the heap writing here. And he warns the little flock. And he gives them the same, the same warnings as Paul does Timothy and you and I. Verse 3, knowing this, First, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. 
So where are we going, what are we talking about here now? The last days. But the last days when? After who? After the dispensation of grace is gone. Okay? What are the scoffers going to say? Verse 4. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are... I, you know what? They, man, this stuff, where's His coming? He, you guys have been talking about Him coming back here, and that's been going on since the fathers died. See the, question? See the scoffer? Well, look at verse 9. Watch Peter answer. By the way, they are ignorant. They are, verse 5... They're willingly are ignorant of it, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in. You know what they missed? They, they went back as the way it's been. They, they went back to creation is what they did in their thinking, and they missed Noah and the flood, which would have showed them and told them about God's what? Judgment and wrath. They went back, you know. Anyway, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is what? long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. Where is this coming? Why has it been delayed? It's his what? Long-suffering. Now look at verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. You guys want to understand the long-suffering of God, you need to go read Paul. Because Paul is what? The pattern of what? Long-suffering. You want to know why the delay, guys, you need to go over here and see Paul because everything Paul's talking about is the long-suffering issue. So the dispensation of grace... No specific signs on its end. It's rather a demonstration of what's going to happen when the long-suffering of God waits. Come back to 2 Timothy 3. And what happens when He waits? It's not... (laughs) It's just going to get worse and worse. It isn't going to get any better. You follow that. Now look at 3.1. So again, as the dispensation of grace goes on, another day of His grace, instead of pouring out judgment and wrath, God allows the, His grace to, go, to extend to another day of grace, to fill up the body of Christ. But there's an impact on the world around us. So he, called, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous. Dangerous. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul knew all about this. Paul understood this. Folks, the last days of prophecy, I mean, look, we can go back to Genesis 49. We can go through John 6. We can run all the verses. They got all of this stuff they're going to be looking for. Okay? In Genesis 49, verse 1, Jacob gives a prophecy looking to his 12 boys, and he says, this is what's going to happen to you in the last days. And then you run over there to verse 28, and you know what it has to do? All that prophecy has to do with with, uh, the fulfilling of the Abrahamic covenant through Israel. That's what it has to do with. Okay? We can go look at all that. Take us three days to do it. I don't want to do that with you. (laughs) Because I don't, I'd rather talk about us. The dispensation of grace, there are no signs. If you're looking for a sign, you're looking for something that you'll never get. So they are perilous times. 2 Corinthians 11, if you look at verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. That they've been talking, the guys here have been talking about their ministers, and really they are the apostles. They've been saying they're apostles of Christ, and really they're the ministers of Satan. Okay, verse 13, 14, 15 there. Verse 23 I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequent, and deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received I, 40 stripes save one. 
Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep. By the way, he writes this in, in Acts 20. He has another shipwreck in Acts 27. So he's not even, you know, there's an indication of maybe even another one, depending on how you read so, some of the verses. So there's at least one, if not two more shipwrecks not mentioned here. A night and a day in the deep. Verse 26, in journeys often in what? Perils of water and perils of robbers and peril, perils. Dangerous, very dangerous conditions that could kill you. So when he talks here about perilous, come over to Romans 8. This is dangerous. Now, fortunately, in our country so far, we're, we haven't had the kill part. It's coming. How do you know it? Because they're just going to get worse and worse and worse. Romans 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? All those physical activities that come up against you. When he talks there about tribulation, he's talking about the pressures of life. Distresses, there's no way to escape them. Persecution, that adverse uh, opinion uh, about what it is to be a believer. Famine, that's economic pressure. Nakedness, it's the absence of physical necessity and luxury. Peril, dangerous, dangers of everyday life in an evil world. The sword, that's, the, that's the, that's talking about the organized opposition of government. Who has the sword? Government does. What are they doing now? Now you, now you can't be a 5013C. Now you can't do this. You can't own property. I tell you, people get all hyped up about the church in the house and yada, yada, yada in the first century. The reason was was because Rome said no churches could own property. So they, where are you going to meet? We'd be the church in the park. I like the park. <laughs> you know, it's, well, what are, where else are you going to get together? People's homes, right? What's happening here? 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Actually, you know what? Oh, go to Ecclesiastes 8. Here's what's going on. Ecclesiastes 8 and get Isaiah 26, and we'll be done. Folks, with the continued long-suffering with the, the continuing of another day of God's grace, it's just going to get worse and worse. Aren't you so glad you came to church today? But for you and I, I'm confident to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For me to die is gain. Ecclesiastes 8 and Isaiah 26. Here's, here is, here's what's going on, okay? Now, Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes this, wisest man ever to walk the planet except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what happens? He sits down and he's been writing about the stuff he's found. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. So if the long-suffering of God is going to continue and the wrath of God has been held back, now, we didn't go look at 2 Corinthians 5, but he's not imputing the sins to the world. Why? Because he's doing this. He's long-suffering, right? That's also the forbearance issue. But look at Ecclesiastes 8.11 and see if this is not true even today. This is one of those trans-dispensational doctrines. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do greatness. No, to do what? That's true in any age, is it not? In the judges, the theme of the judges is there is no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's the theme. Why? There's no, no way to execute judgment and wrath on sin quickly. See that? That's what Paul's talking about. That's what we're going to get into in verses 2 to 5. Why? Because God can't do it? No, he's doing something else. He's withholding the wrath. He would have all men be saved. 
I love that thing when Peter says he would, he, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's what, that's what the Lord wants. He doesn't want to wipe out humanity. He wants what? He wants as many of us to go with him. See? Now look at Isaiah 26 in verse 10. And again, Isaiah 26, the context is the kingdom. But just read the verse. Let favor be showed to the wicked. By the way, what's going to happen out there in the trib? And when There's going to be favor showed to who? The wicked. There's going to be members of the believing remnant, the little flock, as they watch these events happen of the 70th week, and they're going to be a little upset because they're going to see wickedness do what? Prosper. And they're going to be taking it in the neck. That's why they're going to cry, how long, Lord, are you going to let your servants be killed? When are you going to come back and plow? And let him that readeth understand. The believers, they understand he's coming back. It's just a cry of the moment. Let the favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness will he deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. When you let the wickedness run, it'll never go to righteousness. That's what we're talking about in 2 Timothy 3. The long-suffering of God is simply the, the demonstrating the complete depravity of mankind. Because it's just going to get worse and worse, and worse. And the longer the dispensation goes on, the more mature, grown up, that depravity becomes. And it takes over. To where as we go, day in and day out, things are just going to be, they're going to change. So when you come back to 2 Timothy 3, 1, where we're at, we'll pick up in verse 2. <laughs> I, I read this and I go, man, this... It can be very depressing. The difference is, is we know that it should not be that way. It should be what? what? What's our home? Glory. We have a job to do. What is that job? We're to be the pillar and the ground of the truth. And again, he's talking about local churches here. Local churches are made up of individuals who are holding that, sound, that same status. We have... I'm looking for a word for the wall, the, the plaques and stuff. I call it the legacy wall on Facebook. I don't know if that's a right word or not. If you go next door, we, there's a wall there. It's got, we took some stuff out of here, put it over there, and Joel made some, a thing to celebrate 20 years, which is really next year, but he went ahead and did it because I gave him the wrong date. Okay? But we have a legacy. You want to maintain that legacy out. How do you do it? You stand for the truth. You teach the next generation to do what? Stand for the truth. You have to plan like the Lord's going to prolong this dispensation for another 100 years. You can't think about The rapture was never an escape route for you and I. It was never meant for, oh, you know, well, I know we all say, please come back, <laughs> the body's aching. That was, that's <clears throat> wrong. Paul was stoned. Could you... When you get stoned, you get hit with rocks. They break bones. They didn't have the urgent care to go to and say, set it. Luke was there. He would set it. But could you imagine the deform just the physical deformity of being beaten? Forty stripes save one. Not just once, but how many times? Three times. I ain't just beat the tar out of you. And he says, that's eh, okay, put a little salve on it, let's go. Let's keep moving. Why? The bigger going on. What do we, we have that, we got to have that same combative, aggressive thinking about it. So we teach the next generation. That next generation then teaches who? The next generation. Next thing you know, what, what begins? Then they'll say, hey, that church has been around for over 100 years. Look at that. Regardless of what the tides of society bring, they're still there plugging along. If I told you what I was really thinking about things, you'd think I was nuts. But the thing is, is you got to think that way. Not only do I or the leaders do, but you do. 
What happens on the corner here of 10th and Mitchell if we go away? I'm talking about down the road, not today. <laughs> okay? That's what Paul's getting at with Timothy. Timothy, the days are going to be perilous. This is what they're going to look like, and you need to know it. So then, at the end of verse 5, you can stay away from it. And you can then go and continue in the things that you've learned. Okay? This may be depressing, but it's not. It's so you know some things. So when you look out there around about us and you see the, the goofiness that goes on, you don't go, oh, what's going on? No, you know, don't you? When the TV preachers go, we don't, what's going on? You go, ah, I know. <laughs> it's right here, dude. And he looks at you and says, what is that? And it's like, well, it's my Bible. And that's what it says. Follow that? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for everything we have in your son. And for the warning here and the charge that you gave to Timothy, that as we study and look at it, that we would take it to heart and to have the same fortitude that Paul and Timothy would have to carry on, even in the midst of a perverse and evil world. And we would do so for your honor and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.